Good morning. Good to see everybody here today. There are several in the audience today that have not been able to be with us for the last few weeks because of COVID. We're thankful that you're able to be back with us uh, this morning to worship. Um, I do have one prayer request on uh, behalf of my family. Uh, around August of this year, there will be a new addition to the Rogers family. And so I ask that you would pray for my family and for Sarah as she goes through this whole process and for me as I try to take care of her uh, until the baby comes. So we've, uh, I've been asked to make sure that everybody, we announced it Wednesday, but not everybody was here Wednesday, so I wanted to make sure everybody knew that exciting news. We're excited and I hope that you'll, you'll celebrate with us. Um, I invite you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Today we're going to talk about, this is a request from the box that I have in the foyer. And uh, to, we're going to talk about this parable of the dishonest manager. This is a, a text from scripture that by many people is avoided like the plague. Many people, preachers included, do not talk about this parable. And there are, uh, one reason why is because many people attack Jesus in regard to this parable because it seems that what Jesus is trying to communicate here is that he is commending dishonesty. And people say, well, well, they attack Scripture, they attack Jesus, they attack Christianity, uh, they attack all of the things concerning who Jesus is and what he's all about because of what it says about commending dishonesty in this passage. And because of that, many people say, well, we're not going to talk about that. Is that ever, by the way, a good way to respond to critics? When a person says, I don't like Jesus because of this. I don't like Christianity because of this. I don't like Scripture because of this. Uh, okay, the way that I'm going to deal with that is just not talk about it. Just leave it alone. That's not a way to deal with criticism. The best way to deal with criticism is to study the passage, learn more about it, so that we can answer the attacks that the critics have. And so for this reason, many people avoid this parable. And I don't know this, but it may be that the person that submitted this lesson for me uh, read, was reading their Bible one day, came across this parable, and they said, what in the world is Jesus talking about here? How do we deal with this? And they had questions and wanted some clarification. Maybe that's it. It may be that a person understands this quite well, and they just liked the story and they wanted to hear more about it. Uh, I don't know, but many people uh, avoid this passage uh, like the plague. Some people try to deal with critics this way. They try to talk about this parable not being about money at all, but actually about a relationship very much related to Luke chapter 15. Some people interpret this parable to say, well, just like this, uh, this prodigal son, he, he got all of his possessions, he went out and he, he wasted those possessions, he came to himself, he repented, he went back to his father, he threw himself at the mercy of his father, and he was able to be forgiven and be accepted back in the family. And many people interpret the parable of the dishonest manager this way. In other words, it doesn't have anything to do with money and how we use our money to, to deal with other people, what it is is this manager squandered his master's possessions and what he did was went through a sequence of events to throw himself at the mercy of his master and be forgiven by his master. That's not what Jesus is teaching here. Because if that's what Jesus is teaching here, we have some problems. The first problem is that in nowhere in the text are we given the details needed to come to that interpretation. And so the main problem with that interpretation is exegesis. We want to be men and women of exegesis. We want to draw our interpretation and our lessons from the text rather than putting them into the text. And in order to interpret it in relationship to Luke chapter 15, and I'm not saying that there are no relationships to Luke 15 because there are, but if we want to interpret interpret it that way with this manager throwing himself at the mercy of the master, there's just too much that we have to speculate about the text. And so what do we have going on here? Well, I want us to think about, first of all, the context itself. 
because I have some lessons that I'm going to pull up on the screen here, here just a little bit, but I want to take care of some house cleaning things, some preliminaries first. Go back to chapter 15 and read verses 1 and 2. Who is Jesus addressing in Luke chapter 15? He tells three parables. He tells the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son, more otherwise known as the parable of the prodigal son to many of us. But he tells those three parables to who and for what reason. Well, chapter 15, 1 and 2 tells us why. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So what's the problem of the tax collectors and sinners? They're not disciples of Jesus because they attack Jesus on how he relates to sinners and tax collectors. And so they're not willing to receive Jesus. They're not willing to receive sinners and tax collectors. They're not willing to do anything for these people. Rather, what they're doing is they are shunning Jesus, shunning the sinners and tax collectors. And Jesus tells three parables about how God feels about sinners. He loves sinners. The angels in heaven rejoice over sinners who repent. Even one sinner that repents, Jesus teaches. And so Luke chapter 15 is all about the scribes and Pharisees addressing them because they don't want to have any dealings with sinners. They do nothing to help them. And they do nothing to accept Jesus as their Savior. But in chapter 16, verse 1, Jesus says this, He also said to the disciples. The audience has shifted. The Pharisees are still there, we learn by reading verses 10 through 13. The Pharisees are still there listening to Jesus' teaching, but Jesus is not addressing the scribes and Pharisees anymore. Now he's addressing the disciples, those who have received him as their Lord, those who do want, want to know more about how they can help sinners and tax collectors. And that's what this parable is about. You disciples that do accept me and accept the sinners and tax collectors, here's what you need to do for those people that are lost. To give them a better outlook. To give them an eternal reward. And for all of you to have an eternal relationship with one another. I believe that that is what Jesus is teaching in this parable. And so as we know... Parables are stories that people understand from everyday life. And he puts a twist on them to teach lessons. Well, that's exactly what Jesus is, do is doing here, too. Because if you think about friendships and relationships in the Roman world, they were very much different than the way the Jews were supposed to handle relationships. But in the Roman world, if you wanted to get anywhere in life, relationships were involved. If I want to be a great politician, then I've got to surround myself by the great politicians, or, or surround myself around the great politicians of the Roman world. If I'm poor and I want to be rich, well, man, I've got to get around the rich and do what they do and have a relationship with them. If I want to be higher class but I'm lower class, man, I've I got to build a relationship with the higher class. That's the way the Roman world worked. And so Jesus is kind of using that exact same scenario to decide how godly people develop godly relationships with the people around them. Again, the way that we relate to other people is very much different, or at least it should be very much different than the way the Romans dealt with one another, but they understood the idea that Jesus is trying to communicate here regarding the world that was around them. And so even today, though, the Jews understood it here regarding their world. We can understand it too. And so as we begin looking at this, I want to look at verses 1 through 7 and just do kind of a running commentary of those verses because there's a lot here that we can understand in relation to our world today. And so Luke chapter 16, have your Bibles open and follow with me through this text. And the application is going to come from verses 8 and 9 mainly. He also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager. We understand that well, don't we? You've got a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. You've got these huge multi-million dollar uh, football teams, basketball teams, baseball teams, what have you. But you've always got what? 
You've always got a manager. You've got someone managing all of the different things going on in that company or that team because they got to make sure that they're taking care of the possessions that they have. If they're not taking care of the money, then it's going to be wasted. If something's going to be done with it, that's going to hurt that company rather than help it. So here you got a guy that's very rich and he's hired somebody to manage his funds so that things are done accordingly. We understand that. As we continue reading, it says, charges were brought to him, that manager, charges were brought to the manager, that this man was wasting his possessions. The word translated wasting is the exact same word translated squandered in the ESV with the parable of the prodigal son. He squandered or wasted his master's possessions. At least that is a relationship that we have between the prodigal son and this parable here. But he wasted his master's possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management. It may be translated more literally, pay back the account of your management. In other words, I'm hearing that you're squandering my possessions, you're wasting my money. Uh, turn in your, your funds or turn in all of the, uh, the, the account that you have of everything that you've taken, all of the figures that you've written down. I want those. I want to see for myself what you've been doing with my money, in other words. Then he says, for you can no longer be manager. We understand that well, don't we? In today's world, right now, in January, we're probably starting to think about paying our taxes. Caroline's not here, so I'm not going to pick on her. I'll pick on my, the person that does my taxes. Let's say that the person that does my taxes, I, I turn in all of my stuff and I say, here, I want you to take care of this for me. And they look, they start looking at the figures and they think, well, you don't need this much in your expense account. I'm just going to write this figure. Uh, you don't need this much over here in your housing allowance. I'm just going to write figure, uh, write this figure. And they start taking what's left for themselves. And then I think everything's great. A couple of months later, I get a call from the IRS saying, what's all of this? You're, 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 you're breaking the law concerning your taxes. You're not giving me everything that you make. You're not getting credit for everything that you make. And I pick up the phone and I call my tax man and I say, you're fired. I'm not going to let that guy do my taxes anymore. Well, that's exactly what this guy does. I'm not going to let you manage my money anymore. You're wasting it. You're, you're costing me money rather than saving me money, or at least I'm not even breaking even. And so we understand it well. But then we move on, and it says, The manager said to himself, What shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig. Last week, we talked about New Year's resolutions. I would imagine that today there are a lot of people that are sore because they've made a New Year's resolution to start working out and exercising. Their body's not used to it, and so they're very sore because they're working muscles they hadn't used in a long time. This guy's like, I can't dig. I've been sitting at a, sitting at a table crunching numbers my entire life. I can't do physical, manual labor. My body can't handle it. He also says, I'm ashamed to beg. I'm a rich man. I've always been rich. I've had a lot of money, a lot of high standing, a lot of social status. I can't go to somebody and ask for a handout. His pride won't let him do that. He's not physically capable of doing physical labor. His pride won't, hand him, won't let him ask for a handout. And so he's got a dilemma. But then verse 4 is very important. If you've turned your ears off to me, open them back up because we can't understand this parable without looking at verse 4. I have decided what to do so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. Technically, this guy is still the manager of this master's property. It may be that the master said, look, I'm not going to just throw you out on the street. You've got two weeks to get all your stuff in order and find another place, but after that, you got to go. Maybe he's been given a two weeks notice. I'm not so sure about that because we have to ace a jeet to get that, but that may be what's going on here. But probably more likely what's going on here is this guy's been told to go get the account of your management. I want to see the figures for myself. And so he's on his way to go get those things, and while he's going to go get those things, he said, man, I've got to do something 
to ensure that I have a future. I've got to do something to ensure that I have a job. I can't dig. I can't beg. So what am I going to do when I am removed, when I am finally told that I have to get my stuff and get out? What am I going to do? So he's got a little bit of time. But technically, he's still the manager. In verse 5, so summoning his master's debtors, one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And so these, these, these lenders, they don't, or, or those, that, um, the, the, those that, that are in debt to his master, they, techni- they don't know anything about the arrangement. They believe he's still the manager of this household. And so they believe everything that he says when he comes to them one by one. By the way, one by one uh, leads us to believe that there were more than just the two here. Jesus is thinking this is something this guy did over and over and over again. And so it's not just two. It refers to kind of many that this guy has done this with. But anyway, nevertheless, it says uh, that he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down and write 50. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. And they had to do it quickly because he was about to lose his job. Or he knew he was about to have to move out. And so these these debtors, they believe that he's technically their master, or still this, this, this master's manager, and it's a large sum of money. About a year and a half's worth of wages is what these people owe. So this master is a very wealthy guy. The debtors are very wealthy as well. But you understand what he did. He used cleverness, shrewdness, to be able to give himself a future. And then verse 8, we'll just finish what it says. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. I want to stop here and ask you this. What's he being commended for? Is he being commended for being dishonest or being clever? Exactly. The only way you can attack Jesus and attack Christianity using the Scripture is by ignoring the obvious. It's obvious. Jesus calls him a dishonest manager, but he commends him for his shrewdness. You can't mistake that. And so he's not being commended for dishonesty. He's being commended for being clever in how he decided to take care of the issue that he had. He was clever in in establishing a future for himself and a job for himself. But he says, the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. And so what is the point that Jesus is trying to make here? The main point we'll talk about here in just a second. But one thing that I think is overshadowed by all of the things that we're going to discuss today is this fact right here. Jesus wants us to exercise critical thinking in how we deal with each other. Critical thinking is a subject that's brought out all over the place in Scripture in a lot of different contexts. But here we want to just talk about the context of dealing with other people. Sometimes it is obvious that people need our help. You remember the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10? You've got a man going from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he gets robbed. Thieves come in on him, they rob him, they beat him, they throw him to the side of the road, and they leave him for dead. You've got a priest that comes by, walks by on the other side. A Levite walks by on the other side. A Samaritan stops and says, hey, this guy needs some help. I'm going to do what needs to be done. So he puts oil on his wounds, straps him to his donkey, goes and takes him to the innkeeper, pays for a few days for him to lodge there, and takes care of the guy. It was obvious that this man was dying and needed some assistance. By the way, the main point that Jesus is teaching there is that everybody is my neighbor. 
The point is, the Levite, the priest, those that were, should have helped the guy that were Jews, just like this guy, did not help. But the Samaritan did. Man, that's going to open ears and open eyes. The Samaritan helped this guy? What's the point? Everybody is my neighbor. But it was obvious that the guy needed help. Sometimes it's obvious that the people in our respective congregations, the people in our respective communities, it's obvious that they need help. It's obvious that I need to pick up the phone and, and call them and see how they're doing. It's obvious that I need to take food to them. It's obvious that they need a visit. It's obvious that they need a card. Sometimes it's obvious that people need us. But sometimes it's not. Look at what Jesus says again in verse 8. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. And it says, For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. We need to be shrewd. We need to be clever in how we deal with other people because the need's not always going to be obvious. How can I help another person? Well, sometimes I might have to sit down and use my brain to figure out how to do that. In today's world, we really have to do that, don't we? COVID-19 is running rampant in our world. I can't just go to the hospital. I can't just go to a person's house. I can't do all of the things that involve physical labor, physical touch that I might otherwise do if COVID wasn't around. So I have to use my brain a little bit more. Think about it this way as well. Sometimes people don't want our help. Sometimes people want to keep their needs under wraps and they're too humble to ask for it. What do we do to help those people? And the only thing that can be done is for me to critically think about the situation and think, how can I help these people that are in need? Sadly, people of the world are better at taking care of each other than the church is, is at taking care of others. That's what Jesus is saying there. We need to be clever in the way that we deal with people. That involves critical thinking. Along the same lines, the second thing is this. Proper use of money and possessions. If you look at verse 9... It says, I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Again, I'll reiterate what I just said a second ago. Sometimes the people of this world are better at using dishonesty and sin to deal with other people than we in the church are at using righteousness to take care of other people. What is this unrighteous wealth stuff? What is Jesus talking about? Because I think people automatically want to connect unrighteous wealth with dishonesty that Jesus just described. That's not what the unrighteous wealth is. What unrighteous wealth is, is material wealth. It's wealth that has no spiritual consequence whatsoever. My money does not define me. My money has no spiritual consequence whatsoever. But spiritual wealth, that does have a spiritual consequence. Righteous wealth, that does have a spiritual consequence. Let me prove to you that's what Jesus is talking about. Look at verses 10 and 11. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches? So we've got a contrast here, don't we? Whatever true riches is, unrighteous wealth is the exact opposite. Whatever unrighteous wealth is, true riches is the exact opposite. What are true riches? It's evident in Scripture that true riches are the riches that don't fade away. They don't rot. They don't rust. They last for all eternity because they're spiritual in nature. So, in this context, what's unrighteous wealth? Those of a material nature. Those that do rot. Those that do rust. Those that don't last forever. That's unrighteous wealth. And so Jesus is telling us here, use your unrighteous wealth, use your material possessions for the greater good of those around you. And so there's nothing wrong in and of itself with being rich. There's nothing sinful about money. Abraham was a very rich individual. 
Joseph was a very rich individual. Solomon was a very rich individual. Who gave him those possessions? God's the one that gave Solomon his possessions. I've always found it interesting as well that many elders in the church are rich. Titus chapter 1 and verse 7 says elders are God's stewards. The word translated steward in Titus chapter 1 and verse 7 is the exact same word translated manager in Luke chapter 16 in the parable of the dishonest manager. The exact same word. So at least in some ways, being God's steward as an elder and as a Christian for that matter has a lot to do with the way that we use our money. Nothing wrong with being rich, but the way that we use those possessions, that's a different story. We can use and misuse our possessions, and that does have an eternal consequence. There's a lot, of, uh, ex uh, a lot of examples of this in the book of Luke itself. In Luke chapter 18, he's going to talk about the, uh, the parable of the, or excuse me, the story of the rich young ruler. This man comes to Jesus wanting to know how he can enter an eternal reward. Jesus says, well, keep these commandments. And the rich guy gets, gets really excited because he's been observing all of those commandments his entire life. Ever since he was a little boy, he said. Well, Jesus says, sell what you have and give it to the poor. The rich man sadly went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. He missed out on heaven because he wasn't willing to do something good with his possessions as far as sharing them with somebody that was in need. In this very chapter, Luke 16, we've got the parable, or excuse me, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. You've got a rich man that's, uh, that's robed in purple. He, set at, he sits at his table. He feasts sumptuously every single day. But then you've got Lazarus that's wounded, sitting at the gate of this palace, wanting to be eating at least the crumbs that fall from the master's table, but he's not willing to give him anything. This rich man's not willing to give Lazarus anything. The plot thickens when they both die. Lazarus finds himself in paradise. The rich man finds himself in torment. He wouldn't do what was good and right for another person with his possessions. Luke chapter 12, we could go further. The story of the rich fool. You've got this guy that spent all of his life. He's, he's got all of these these crops, they're, they're continuously growing and getting more full, and he's finding himself in, in a pickle because he doesn't have any room to keep them all. And so what, what's he going to do? He's going to tear down his barns. He's going to build bigger ones. He's going to set back and rejoice with all that he has, and it's all about him. Jesus says, you fool. You've got these great possessions, but there's one thing you failed to do. You failed to prepare for eternity. There's nothing wrong with being rich, but how I use those possessions can keep me out of heaven. If you look over at Luke chapter 12, this, the, the, the lesson that was just read for us by Bill just a second ago, there's a lot of reasons why people give and why they don't give. That's another lesson in and of itself, but it's kind of overwhelming in Scripture the number of reasons that we can come up with of why people give and why they don't give. Well, in Luke 12, beginning in verse 22, Luke gives us one reason why people don't give. It's because they're scared. People are scared. It's the, what Jesus said about being anxious. Don't be anxious about your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, about your body, what you're going to put on. God's going to take care of you. Don't worry about those things. Many people don't give because they're scared to death. What if something happens? What if a crisis happens in my life and I, I've got to have some money stored up to use? They're scared to death. They're not going to have enough. But notice what Luke says in response to that, or actually what Luke records Jesus as saying in response to that. Verse 32, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We don't have to fear anything as far as possessions are concerned. I can give everything that I have away, but guess what God's still going to give me? Something that doesn't rot, something that lasts forever, an eternal future. Why should I be afraid of anything when God gives me that? 
Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In Luke 19, we have the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus, but he was short. And there was a big crowd around him, so he ran and got in a sycamore tree so he could see Jesus. Jesus comes to the sycamore tree, grabs Zacchaeus and says, Come on, I'm going to stay at your house today. Jesus walks into the house of a tax collector, a sinner. Uh-oh, we've got an issue. Because in verse 7, when they saw it, they grumbled. He has gone into the guest of a man who is a sinner. And I love what Zacchaeus does next. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. You know what Zacchaeus is doing there? you got these people standing outside the crowd. He's gone in to be the guest of of a sinner. uh, Zacchaeus says, you know what, Jesus? Yeah, I'm a sinner. I'm a tax collector. I've taken more than what I was supposed to, and I kept the rest for myself. But here's what I'm going to do. Because I'm a disciple of yours now, I'm going to give it all back. And I'm going to do you one better. I'm going to restore it fourfold. We have examples in Scripture of people that lose their possession, their spiritual, their eternal possession, because they don't do anything with their money to help another person out. But we have examples in Scripture as well of people that are spiritually, eternally blessed because they use their possessions for good. I don't know of one example. I I, I challenge you to find one and prove me wrong. I don't know of one example anywhere in the entire Bible that a person is said to have been blessed for withholding something they have from another person that needs it. It's not there. We won't find it. The only way we can be blessed and be rich at the same time is if we use it for good. Otherwise, the consequences are not going to be in our favor. And so one more thing I want us to talk about. Stewardship can also lead to salvation. In Luke 16, in verse 9, I want you to notice what it says at the end of the verse. Jesus says, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth. And I think we concluded to use our material possessions to help other people lead them to Christ because so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. What does it do when I bless another individual? it leads to an eternal relationship with that person. Um, The word translated wealth in the ESV, the New American Standard, and the NIV, I believe, uh, is the word, the basic Greek word for mammon. If you're reading a New King James, you actually have that as your translation. It says mammon. Two things I want to say about that. Number one, what Jesus is talking about here is not just what we do with our paper money. He's not saying, sit down and write a check every time you get the opportunity. That's not just what he's saying. What am I doing with my vehicle? What am I doing with my pantry? What am I doing with anything that is a possession of mine that I can use for good? What am I doing with those things? That's what Jesus is basically saying here. But the second thing is this. I don't have to understand Israel's history with the mammon accident in the... uh, the, the wilderness, to be able to understand this parable. But when I study that incident further, something great comes to light. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. We're going to look at two verses, verse uh, 3 and verse 16. Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3. Deuteronomy 8 is a good passage to where Moses reminds Israel of all the things that God has done for them. They've been in the wilderness for 40 years. But guess what? They've never had to change their shoes. They've never had to change their clothes. None of those things rotted and faded away in 40 years. Tell me the providence of God is not an eternal blessing. Verse 8, or excuse me, verse 3. He humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know. 
Nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not, believe, not, does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. There's a lot of no's in that verse, isn't there? There's a reason for that. Read it with me again. I want to focus on some things. He says, he let you hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know. When we read Exodus 16, where the manna first appeared to Israel, what did they say when they woke up the next morning and saw it on the ground? What in the world is this stuff? We've never seen this stuff before. And that's what manna means, right? It means what is it? They had no clue what this stuff was. They had never seen it before. So he gave them manna that they did not know. And he also says that your fathers did not know. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, none of the spiritual fathers had ever had anything done for them like this. They didn't know anything about what the manna was about because not, God never gave it to them. This is something that is specific to the congregation of Israel itself. Nobody else can relate to this blessing the way that they can because God's never done it before. But then he, why did he do this? That he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by, the, by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Why did I give you something that I've never given to anybody else? Because I wanted you to know that it came from only one place and could only come from one place. And that was me. But in verse 16, we go a little bit further. Why did God do it? Why did God want to give them a blessing like this? Who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know that he might humble you and test you and, and, and underline or highlight this next phrase. To do you good in the end. Why does God bless His people? Why does He humble them to allow them to see how good He is? Because He wants them to do good in the end. When we bless other people with our material things that God has blessed us with, and there's no way that our material blessings will ever be on par with God's. There's no way. But when we bless other people with our material possessions that God has blessed us with, that's only going to lead to humility. It's only going to lead to godliness. And humility and godliness will always lead to salvation. And so Jesus says, do these things so that, read it again, when, you, when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. We're doing this to build an eternal relationship with me and my God, with me and another person, with another person and God. That's what all of this is able to do, using our unrighteous wealth for the greater good of another individual. Let's not let the world be better at serving other people than we are at serving them. Using sin to serve other people, how can that be better than using righteousness to serve others only if we don't do our part and what God tells us to do. As we close today, we cannot be unfaithful with our possessions and faithful spiritually at the same time. It doesn't work that way. Read verses 10 through 13 with me as we close. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. We can't be unfaithful materially with our material possessions and be faithful spiritually. Doesn't happen. So my question for you this morning is, what are you doing with your material possessions to glorify God? Nobody is saying you have to give everything that you have in the collection plate. It's not what God is saying. God is saying, think outside the box. What can I do for another individual to not only help them out physically, 
but help them out spiritually. We really have to use our brains concerning COVID-19 on how to help other people. It may be that, that there's somebody here that's wondering, well, what in the world can I do to help another individual? I can't visit them. I can't take them food because I can't get around them. I can't touch them. I can't give them a hug. What can I do? Here's what you can do. You can find ways to use your possessions to serve others. And might I consider doing this? If I can't do anything else, if I don't know what else to do, put it in the collection plate. Because the Lord's church is all about using what God has blessed us for the eternal good, not only of this congregation, but for the spread of the gospel and the internal good of the world. If you're here this morning and you need to repent for any sin that you've committed, maybe you've drifted away from God and you want to rekindle your relationship with Him, let us pray for you and comfort you this morning. There may be someone here today that's not a Christian and they want to put Christ on in baptism. They want Him to wash their sins away, but they haven't done that yet. Maybe you've been thinking about it and you're not really sure if, if it's the right time, if it's the right thing for me to do. It is the right thing for you to do. And it's always the right time. If you need to respond to the invitation for any reason, please do it this morning as we stand.